Hi, my name is John Richter and I want to acknowledge you for making it this far in the Keon Cold Thermo Challenge. If you've made it this far doing the cold showers or maybe you're doing ice baths, you might be wondering, what do I do to take this to the next level? So that's why I'm here to give you some ideas on how you can do that. I'll give you a brief background about me and I'll give you some additional resources that uh, you can check into. I got into the cold plunge thing about five years ago or the cold water uh, from Wim Hof, but had a really hard time finding cold water in central Texas where we have a subtropical climate. Uh, summer lasts about eight months out of the year, so it's difficult. And when a friend suggested that I could use a chest freezer to create a cold plunge, uh, that was pretty awesome to me. For the folks who don't have an unlimited or a very high budget to be able to get cold water professionally done, you can do it yourself with a chest freezer. When I started doing this, I made so many mistakes and I tried to fix those mistakes, which ended up causing other problems that I had to then fix. And it was just this downward spiral, uh, which ultimately turned into an upward spiral, but I, I got it dialed in and I figured it out. But I, it was way harder and cost way more money uh, than what it really has to. And during that process, almost uh, not quite two years ago, I started a Facebook group and invited other people to come in who were interested in cold water immersion and wanted to build or convert a chest freezer as well. And so we started talking about what was going wrong, what are the best practices, how could we prevent these common problems. Out of that came an ebook that I wrote. It's nearly 277 pages that goes into this thing in a huge amount of detail. Uh, but in this brief video, I'm gonna give you five tips that you can use to convert that chest freezer into a cold plunge to take this to the next level. So the first thing is safety. Anytime you're using a chest freezer, you wanna unplug everything from the wall, including the chest freezer and any other electrical components, whether they're being used for the chest freezer or anything else that might be nearby. The next thing is um, before you even go and buy a chest freezer, and we'll talk about that, but you do want to create some kind of plan. You want to know in advance, what are your goals? How much time do you have? What is your expertise level in terms of doing it yourself and using tools and things? Uh, where are you going to put it? Do you have a spare room in your house? Is it going to go in a garage, on a porch? Are you in an apartment? What floor of the apartment are you on? Do you have a balcony? How is that balcony built? Is it strong enough to hold a chest freezer? How much time do you have to commit to this project? How much maintenance? are you willing to do to keep this thing up and running? The next thing is once you've figured out the plan that you're going to um, uh, implement for the chest freezer and the cold plunge, you want to find out what kind of chest freezer are you going to buy. You need to make sure that it's sized correctly so it's not too small or not too big. You want to think Goldilocks is just right. You've got to fit in there uh, and be able to move around, but you don't need too much space either. So finding the right size is important. Try them out if you can. Right now, we have a unique challenge with what's going on across the globe with the uh, COVID-19 uh, situation. And chest freezers have been in short supply or almost in no supply, depending on where you live. So how do you find a chest freezer in the middle of a pandemic when people have bought them all to store food in? One thing is to look on uh, your local marketplaces, uh, for sale sites like Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. You might be able to find a used chest freezer that somebody no longer needs uh, or is getting rid of. Uh, if you have the budget for a new chest freezer, uh, most of the big box retailers are completely out of chest freezers. So here's the thing to do. Here's your key tip for finding a new chest freezer. Go to the manufacturers, stick with major brands, look for the ones that have great reviews on Amazon or Best Buy or any other major retailer like that. And uh, once you find out who makes it, just go to their website and find a retailer or a, a dealer that's in your geographic area close by and call those folks up. As long as they're not a big box store, you will get a live human being on the phone who is helpful and useful and they can actually call the manufacturer and they can find out when they can actually get that chest freezer ordered for you. Now, in terms of uh, buying the chest freezer, a couple of other quick tips. What type of chest freezer? They come in really two varieties. There are the ones that have the bare metal interior, the floor and the walls, or you've got the ones that are uh, painted white. It looks like plastic, but it's actually a very high grade enamel paint. If possible, get the one with the white interior not the metal. They're better constructed and it'll last a lot longer than the ones with the bare metal interiors. So after you've purchased your chest freezer, the next thing you need to do, the third tip is how do you waterproof that thing? There's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, you see a lot of videos with people saying, oh, silicon or caulking is the way to go. Don't ever put caulking in your chest freezer. It's not meant to hold water. It's not even waterproof. Silicon is a better option. 
And some people have had uh, silicon in their chest freezers and they say you've got absolutely no problems and I'm always glad to hear that. However, silicon is also the number one product that has problems reported on it from people sealing it. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. Either the product itself was a cheap product or it wasn't, the surface wasn't prepared thoroughly or correctly in order for it to be applied, uh, or it could just be poor workmanship. There's a lot of factors that go into it. The other option would be to use a, an epoxy putty. In the United States, JB Waterweld is the go-to solution for that. If you live in another country, there are other alternatives. As far as anything else that you might see, like uh, Flex Seal, as seen on TV, most of that stuff is complete junk. Don't do it. If you're thinking about painting the inside of your chest freezer, don't do it. Oh, but it's pool paint. It got, don't don't do it. All right. We've seen all these problems. People have done all these different things and we know what works and what doesn't work. So uh, stick with the stuff that we know is going to give us the greatest amount of success or the greatest chance of having the greatest success with sealing all of those seams. Now the other option would be to put in some kind of liner. You could do the most simple thing possible and just go buy a pond liner and put it in there and fill it up with water. Uh, if you want to do a, a, a spray liner like for ponds or, um, or, or truck, truck beds, they have these things you can spray line. Um, you can do that. Now, if you have a lot of experience with that, that's great. If you don't, I highly recommend that you get a professional to do this for you. If you are looking at the spray liners, be sure to get something that's uh, certified to be used for potable water, drinking water. That way it's not going to leach toxic chemicals out that could potentially hurt you. So um, if you are going to put in something like a pond liner, do you need to seal the seams? What do you think? Yes, you do. Rusting is one of the most common problems reported in chest freezers used for food storage. So yes, they still have moisture problems. So seal those seams with uh, silicone. That would be okay if you're gonna put in a pond liner. But uh, if you're just gonna fill it up with water, don't use silicone. So the next thing is uh, chilling the water. How do you get the water cold enough? Well, the most simple thing is just to plug it in. Once you plug it in, that water is going to start chilling down and uh, then all you have to do is just be mindful about unplugging it and plugging it in when you get to your target temperature that you're going for. And uh, the thing is, if you're not careful or if you forget, you could end up with a chest freezer that's one giant block of ice in there. That's not good for the chest freezer. So what you want to do is recommend that if you have a, a limited budget, you could spend 10 to $20, get in a heavy duty appliance timer and just have that chest freezer run. You, you just got to figure it out. How long do I need to run it each day? A few hours each night uh, to have that water temperature maintain at a fairly constant level. If you want to be a little bit more precise than that, you can buy a temperature controller. And those devices can start at about $40 and go up to a couple hundred dollars or more depending on quality and what kind of device you want to get. But the temperature controller has a sensor that actually goes into um, the, the chest freezer itself. And that sensor tells you the water temperature and then you've got a range that you program into the controller. And that way you can keep that water temperature within a couple of degrees one way or the other. You don't have to worry about timers or the temperature changing or anything else. So <clears throat> that's the option for the temperature controller, keeping your water cold. Then in terms of maintenance, uh, what do you do with maintenance? Uh, some people say, yeah, just fill it up, you don't need to do anything. And then after a few days, they get this really gross, disgusting water that's just turning cloudy and yucky. And you know, you wouldn't reuse the same bath water. So why would you wanna use the same uh, water in your chest freezer and think that it's gonna be any different? Some people think, oh, the cold water kills all the bacteria. No, it doesn't. <laughs> the cold water just might slow them down a little bit, but it's not going to stop them. Clean water is really made up of three things. You need circulation, you need filtration, and you need sanitation. The circulation just gets the water moving, okay? And you, you've got to have the moving water. That's going to help. But then you have to have a filter, a mechanical filter, that takes out all the big stuff like hair, skin flakes, you know, oils from your skin, and that sort of thing. And then you've got to have something to clean the water. There's a lot of options for this. You could use chlorine, some people have used hydrogen peroxide, uh, UV lights, there's a lot of different options in this. But uh, the thing is that, um, you know, ozone, you've got to find something that you're comfortable with setting up and that you can use on a regular basis and that you can maintain and it's easy for you. And you've got to 
find out what that is, you know, whether it's simple as putting chlorine tablets and just testing the water, or if you want to get like an ozone generator like I have over here, and that thing runs for just uh, 30 minutes a day, every day, and I don't have to worry about it. But you do have to get all three of those set up. I'm going to recommend that you use an internal aquarium pump and filter. Trying to set up an external pump and do all that plumbing, I've done that. I've done two versions of that, and it is really difficult to do correctly and set it up without causing just a huge amount of problems. So you can get a very simple internal or submersible aquarium pump that has a filter built into it. And that way you've got the water circulating in there. You just change out that filter every week or every couple of weeks as needed, and it makes it very easy. You also unplug that every time before you get in. So clean water made up of three things circulation, filtration, and sanitation. If you have any one of those missing, your water is not gonna be as clean as what it should be. And you are risking your health. You are risking your health by putting yourself in water that's not being uh, sanitized, circulated, and filtered. I hope you found this video helpful in terms of at least steering you in the right direction. There's way, way, way more to it than what we have time to get into, and I'm very happy to answer your questions. Uh, you can check out the Facebook group at the Chest Freezer Cold Plunge. Uh, just do a search on Facebook, or you can find my website at chestfreezercoldplunge.com. You can get my ebook there, um, uh, or just uh, reach out to the folks here. Where I'm not sure where this video is going to end up. It might be on Instagram or YouTube, but uh, I'll be checking it out. I'll be following to see what comments are made, and I'll be sure to get any of your questions answered. So uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Stay safe and be well.